There are four problems, so let us let us take 15 minutes for problem. Um, I will briefly discuss. Okay, the the problem here is a very straightforward. I, I think it's a very one of the more popular problems. So what is happening here is that that we have a step of size h. The coefficient of friction between all points of contact is given to be equal to mu s. You are applying a force p at the top, and the weight of the cylinder is 25 kgs. Radius of the cylinder is given to be 3 meters. And you are asked that if the coefficient of friction is equal to 0.3, I want to lift this cylinder, which means that the cylinder while lifting will lose contact with this point and completely be hinged about point A. And you are asked to find out that what is the maximum value of H such that the cylinder will not slip at point A. Okay, is the problem clear? It's a very, it's a well-known problem, I think. So a couple of people had asked me this problem. But uh, any question about the problem? Okay, just have a look at this. Okay, it will like not take you more than 10 minutes. Okay, it's a three-fourths member. Okay, you realize that three-fourths member and all the ideas we had used about the tipping toppling will all be applicable here. Okay, so uh, shall we move on, or uh, are there any uh, common questions? So the typical strategy, which I think many of you have figured out, of course, is that while the cylinder is being lifted off, it has to lose contact with the ground because of which now it has three forces, P, W, which pass through point A, and a third force has to point through pass A, otherwise it will create a torque about point A and the assembly will not be in equilibrium. Now that immediately tells you that as a function of height, okay, if this angle is phi, this angle is phi, note that this angle phi is angle made by the effective, friction, effective force with respect to the normal. Okay, from this point, this is the normal, this phi, is the angle made by the total reaction at point A with respect to the normal and so phi can maximum value be equal to phi s or coefficient of friction, tan inverse of mu. This is phi, this is phi, this will be 2 phi and what we know that the height will be given by r times, this r is the radius, 1 minus cos 2 phi. Note one thing that h max will be possible if this quantity is as small as possible when phi becomes as large as possible. But since phi max, phi max is equal to tan inverse mu, you immediately put that in and you get what is the maximum value of the height. Okay? Now note one question for you. If, for example, when you barely lift off the cylinder, okay, you pull on it, the cylinder is barely lifted from the ground and when it is barely lifted from the ground, there is no slippage at A. But your ultimate goal is to take the cylinder completely up. Do you think that if you can achieve the goal about lifting the cylinder just above the ground without slipping at A, can you lift the complete cylinder afterwards? Is that point clear? That your ultimate goal is what? To take the cylinder completely upwards. You start that process by putting a force such that it loses contact with the ground completely pinned at A. But the question is that, now if you can manage to successfully do that, will you be completely guaranteed that you can lift it up fully now? Yes or no? No? Yes? Okay, it will be guaranteed. Why? Because think about it. If you take the cylinder, it is just losing contact. Now, if you take it go upward and upward, what will happen is that this point will keep going up and up. What is effectively happening that the step height, apparent step height, will keep decreasing. That apparent step height that the cylinder will see, because if this point keep moving upward, this will rotate about point A, and the apparent height it will see will keep decreasing because how much it gets lifted up by that will cut off from that height edge. And since we know that it is a larger height which will cause a problem, that effective height because it is decreasing, once you are assured that this, this lift off, like the initial lift off is completely uh, risk free, then you can just take the cylinder upwards. Okay, so that is the overall logic of this problem. Any question? Because otherwise, like if you lift it up and then while trying to lift it, it again falls down. So what's the point? You lift, fall, lift, slip, lift, slip. So that's not, but here you are ensured that if you can manage to lift it just off the ground, you can just take it off fully. Huh? There will not be any rolling in any case. Because if, if point A, there is no impending slippage at point A, in this case, 
there will be no impending slippage afterwards. Why? Because the effective height is decreasing. Height decreasing, yeah? Sir, in all the problems it happens. Where? In all the problems no, it, it happens. No, it does not happen. That's why. So I did not explicitly mention, you think about it. You think about it and you will realize that when we get that, that limit, na, within that limit, you cannot find the forces. But what you know is that outside that limit, it will slip. Outside that limit, it will slip. But within that, and how do you confirm? One way to confirm is this, that if you are within some limit, okay, some force is there where is no, no impending slippage. What you do is this. You assume that what will be the coefficient of friction that is required to cause an impending slippage. And if that coefficient of friction comes out to be lower than the given value, then you know that the system is stable. You see the point, like for example. Apparent height, whatever you are talking now. Now that apparent height, now what you do is solve the problem again, assuming impending slippage at A. Okay, but now you will get a coefficient of friction now. Because H is given. You will back a coefficient of friction, but that coefficient of friction now will turn out to be lesser than the value there, which means that for impending slip to happen, your friction should be lower, but you actually have higher slip friction, so no impending slippage will happen. You are turning the problem around, think about it. To miss, for example, to convince yourself that this will not happen, that you just say, suppose impending slippage happen. Backtrack, what should be the coefficient of friction? That coefficient will turn out to be lower than what is given. You are solving it in the other way around. Okay, shall we move on now? Sir, the solution can be done by using Lamy's theorem here. What is, I don't know this great theorem. Lamy's theorem, that is sine rule. P by sine alpha. Three, because three, you can always use sine rule. Three, yes, they yes. will form a triangle, you can use sine rule. Yes, if there is no friction at uh, uh, the contacting surface, the re uh, reaction is Passing perpendicular to it, of course. And as there is friction there, huh. the reaction force will be making an angle of phi. It will make 90 angle minus phi. phi. That phi is an unknown. Phi is an unknown. You had given uh, the value of phi, uh, mu. But only at that maximum height h, when the slippage is about to happen, phi will become equal to phi s. Yes, sir. That is for this equilibrium. You can, See, you can take it as equilibrium. At impending equilibrium, when there is an impending slippage at point a. That is also equilibrium, no? Yeah, but at yes, impending sir. equilibrium, that's a special point. Any height lower than the critical height, yes. you cannot say, you can only say that the direction is given by the geometry. Yes. But that will not be equal to phi s. Okay, so essentially that having all those intersect at the same point is equivalent to the Lamy's theorem or sine rule, okay? They're all the same thing. So whatever you find convenient, okay, you can definitely do that. So what about B is acting on center of the product? Which one? P. P is acting at the top, na? The center means what about reaction? Where reaction? That's center ke weight is acting to the center, right? Weight is, assume it's a nice uniform cylinder. I should have said it explicitly, but nice cylinder, all load acting to the center. So two lines intersect at the top, so third has to go there, otherwise it will create a torque about the top point. Okay? Yes, please. How it's coming? Two pi. Two pi? Oh, two pi. Oh, that is pi, now. that is phi. So there's an isosceles triangle. So if this is phi, other angle is also phi. So phi plus phi, two phi there. External angle. Yes, sir, external angle, right? So it's phi, phi, it's two phi. Okay? So let us move on. A little bit of a difficult problem. Not too much. Some thinking will be required. So, so what we have here is we have a wedge. It's a wedge problem. So what I have tried to do is I try to cover as many problems of different categories as possible. So we have a wedge. We have a cylinder. Okay. The wedge triangle is five degrees. The cylinder is resting on the wedge. What is told is the coefficient of friction between all three points of contacts, one, two, and three, is one by four. And you're asked to find out that if that is given, the weight of the cylinder is 1,000 pounds, the weight of the wedge is taken to be negligible. You're asked to find out what is the force P required to move the wedge. And clearly from the direction, what is the force P required to move the wedge internally? Okay, you want to move it inwards. Okay, and when I say P, what is the minimum force P required? Of course, you apply larger force, it will move. What is the minimum force P required to move this wedge in the inward direction? Is the problem clear? If statement is really straightforward, like most problems in friction. Some thinking, not much. How many unknowns do we have? Four unknowns on the cylinder. Okay. One, two, three, four. Bottom, how many unknowns? Two unknowns. Line is also unknown, but forget about that. Equations and the P, P is also an unknown. So we have the number of unknowns is four plus two, six plus one, seven. 
Seven. How many? How many equations do we have? Three for the cylinder, two for the wedge. So we need. We have seven unknowns, five equations. We need two extra equations. So slip should happen at two places. Okay. How many surfaces do we have? Three. Okay. So there are three possible combinations in which the slip can happen. And now in this problem, it will be very beneficial that if we can have an idea about how the motion, how the impending motion can happen so that you can immediately fix what are the directions. If you know the impending, if you can visualize what is the impending motion, the directions will automatically get fixed now. So two surfaces should you have slippage. One thing, okay, any question? One thing you can realize is it is not possible. Sir? Yes, very well. In the previous question, what is the role of W? Role of W, no? Yeah, that was given as 25. Role of w, the, the w is the villain here. That W is making your life difficult. Okay. <laughs> right? Because W is making your life difficult. If W is zero, what? This problem is not there. You just uh, come and take it up. I think that has not okay. been used in any of the equation, I think. No, no, but, but it depends on what we are asked, right? We are asked to find out H max. If you are asked to find out P, then it will come, no? And P depends on H. So if you are asked to find out what is P for H max, W will play a role. But just note one thing, that even though there are two combinations, so slip can happen combinations, what combinations? Here and here, here and bottom, here and bottom. But the first assumption that slip happening here and here is not possible because we want the wedge to go in. And just by having slip here, simultaneously it is not going to rotate. So this mode of motion, impending motion, where slip happens here and here is not. It's, it's, you can immediately throw that out. So essentially the competition between does the slip happen here and here or here and here. And think about the wedge is trying to move inside. So we need to find out what is the impending motion so we can immediately decide what is the direction of friction. Think about it. Any questions, ask. So let me just briefly discuss the problem. Okay. Okay, the idea is this. What is given? Okay, let us ask the question. We are asked to find out that this wedge, what force minimum P we should apply such that the wedge move inwards? Minimum force. So what do we know is that the impending motion of this wedge should be inwards. Now just think about it. How many unknowns we had? We had just looked at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven unknowns. We had three equations from this free body, two from this. So five equations, seven unknowns, we need two slippage. Now the two slippage can happen in different ways. It can like, for example, this center cylinder can have an infinitesimal rotation giving slippage at one and two. But this is useless. Why? Because first of all, a cylinder cannot simultaneously, uh, spontaneously start to rotate. On top of that, in this mechanism, wedge does not go anywhere, which is what we want. So this is out. First one is completely out. Come to the second one. If the wedge moves inwards, there is clearly a slippage here at the bottom point. But when the wedge moves in, just note that this cylinder ka center has to go up. Because in the height is this, if you push the wedge in, the cylinder has to go up a little bit. You agree with me? Cylinder has to briefly go up. But then what happens? That if you think about it, if the cylinder ka center just translates upwards, then you will have a slip at this point also and at this point also both at the bottom and the top point. We don't want that. So if we want to have slippage only here, for example, and not here, then what we do is that we give it a clockwise rotation, okay, such that this point, in addition, it will move even more upwards a little bit, whereas this bottom point, whatever distance it had gone uh, slipped up, it will cover that distance. So this is one mode of slipping. But now, look at other mode of slipping. If the slippage does not happen here, but here. Center has to move up. So this motion is mandatory. But this point will also slip. In addition, if we provide a rotation in the anticlockwise direction, a very small rotation, then you can cover up. This moved up, okay, this moved up, but we rotated a little bit so that we covered that distance down. And so no slip here, but this point moved up, so there has to be slippage here. And no matter what you do, if this mode of slippage happen, this point has ultimately slide upwards with respect to the wall, so the friction will be down. If this point is slipping, then this point is going to slide upwards relative to the wedge, so the friction will be downwards. And ultimately, the free body diagram will always look like this. This is F, for this mode, this is F, 
but torque balance about points will immediately guarantee that this also has to be f. If the slippage happened here, then this point moved relatively upwards. So the slippage is upwards, so the friction force should be down. And that also automatically guarantees for moment equilibrium of this free body about point C, that the friction at top point should be in the downward direction. So this has to be the free body diagram for the top cylinder. F, F, these are the directions. Normal reaction one, normal reaction two, equal and opposite on the wedge. This is P, and there is a slippage here, N3. And because there is a slippage, F3 will be equal to mu s N3. So is the free body diagram clear? That this is how the free body diagram will look like from the considerations of the problem, both kinematic and equilibrium considerations. And now we have to process this further. Any questions about this? The kinematics, now just visualize. So for example, tomorrow, we are going to do principle of virtual work, and when we'll solve principle of virtual problems, you will realize that how to take care of infinitesimal rotations and see that like how different components, when they move, what is their motion? It will become more clear, but if you think about it, you will realize that that is the only way for this problem, you can have the directions of all the frictional forces. Yes, unambiguously. Somebody had a question? Think just a little bit, like, and it's not difficult. Just think how that infinitesimal motion can happen. And this is the only way you can have all the friction forces. There is no other possible way which is consistent with the definition of the problem that the wedge goes inwards and that all the subparts and the full system is in equilibrium. Any question about this? And once you know this, you're good. Now, second idea is to figure out, will the slip happen? Is this mode going to happen or this mode going to happen? Because we know by problem definition that slip will always happen at the bottom portion. There is no choice because the problem is telling us that the wedge should go inwards. But now the question is, will the slip happen here at the vertical wall or between the cylinder and the wedge? And to answer that question, what we realize is this. Draw this line, two tangents, okay, along the direction of friction. Just note here, if I draw the free body diagram for this, what you will see is that, that N1 times D plus W times R is equal to N2 times D for moment equilibrium. So immediately it becomes clear from here that N2 is more than N1. And since the friction forces are the same, the coefficient of frictions are also the same, you immediately know that N2 more than N1 implies that there will be no slippage at this point, only slippage at this point. And when the slippage happens at the vertical point, you automatically know that F will be equal to mu s nu N1 as far as this problem is concerned. Now what we do? We have N1 mu s N1. Take this free body diagram, take torque about point B. You will immediately find out what is the value of N1. You get that N1 will be equal to 120.3 approximately. Now what you do is that you know N1, you know F. So it's a very simple way to do this problem is you look at the full free body diagram, one plus two put together. Now full system is also in equilibrium. We want a normal reaction. What is normal reaction? F plus W will be equal to N3 for equilibrium of this complete system. But we already know F, which is equal to mu s N1. So we immediately know what is N3. Now once you know N3, there is a slippage at the bottom point, so F3 is equal to mu s N3. So we know also the friction. Now the only unknown in the system is P, is what we want. For this complete free body diagram, take equilibrium in the X direction. So N1 plus Fs or plus F3 will be equal to P, and you immediately see that the force P required to move the block inwards will be approximately equal to 377.8 or 378 pounds. Okay, so by kinematic considerations, by free body equilibrium, taking appropriate free body diagrams, you could see that the problem so-called, it, it looks reasonably formidable to begin with, but by doing it in some way, okay, you can see that like by just three equations, which are not too complicated, we could immediately solve the full answer that we desired. Of oh, what? N2. N2. You don't need N2 really because, okay, okay, if you want to get N2, okay, then just come here, look at this free body diagram. If F is known, first of all, is, do you think F is known or not? If F is known or if F is equal to mu times N2, assuming slippage is here. Then you just like torque about point A, you will get N2. And if you want to solve what is N2 for this diagram, okay, what you can do is uh, take equilibrium of this free body along this direction. There are so many different ways in which you can get N2. Yes, please. What five equations? Oh, oh, oh. I can write five possible equations, right? 
what are three. the possibilities? You know, three questions for this free body diagram. So moment, uh, x moment direction. Moment force x, force y. Yeah, yeah. Another three two. Moments, about three points which are not collinear. Oh, and two. for for the bottom wedge, fx and fy, equilibrium. Okay. So three plus two, five. So six unknowns. What is the six unknowns? One, two, three, four, five, six, plus one. So six plus one, seven. UK unknowns. Five equations. So we need a difference, which is two. We need two extra equations to solve this problem. So sure. two slips. Uh, two slips. Okay, because the most naive thing to do is, for example, assume that like sleeping happen, sleep is happening everywhere. But then that problem becomes over constrained, and you will see that you will not get a consistent answer which satisfy all the equilibrium conditions. Okay. W cos theta. Okay. Okay. If you take W cos theta is equal to. No, it is not because just look. Now, W cos theta vertical component. There is also. A, F, which is acting in the world, W cos theta is what? Only this force. Downwards. But now, for the top free body diagram, we also have vertical, the friction is acting vertical. Even here, N2 ka vertical component, this friction will also have a vertical component, which will be equal to F sin theta. Is it a compulsory to uh, total weight of the energy directly it will be because of the friction. More in this case, more. In this case, more. F plus W will be equal to N3. The weight, weight W. W prime is zero here. Okay, the weight of this wedge is very small. We are taking it to be zero. That is zero. Yes. Okay, the uh, whole weight of the sphere yeah. will direct will not directly transfer to this wedge because of the friction. Yes. So, so the bottom N3 is equal to W plus F. No, sir, sir, we have to calculate first N2, then only we can... No, we don't need to. Why? Listen, because what we can do is we can draw the complete free body diagram. Like, for example, don't expose N2 at all. The cylinder and the wedge is my free body. Who is stopping me from doing that? Because if the system is in equilibrium, not only the whole body is in equilibrium, any small part of the system and combinations, all are in equilibrium. So I can draw the complete free body. means like just merge these two together. So these will cancel each other out. No contribution, equal opposite, equal opposite, gone. So the only forces which are not cancelling each other out is this, 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 and the weight. Take the full free body diagram. And why? You may say, why? So at some point, you have to use your judgment. You could have as well done, for example, like found out N2 and then transferred at N2, but that's an extra step, and I don't need N2. If I need it, you do it. But in this problem, we don't need it. All the time, we can do. We cannot do like this. No? All the time, you cannot. Of course not. It all depends what is the requirement of the problem, how the problem is. So it's a judgment. After some time, it becomes more of an art like than science actually. So definitely we should move uh, by judging, by determining the value of N2 then. You can find it. But in this problem, you don't need N2 is all I'm trying to say. If you feel comfortable finding N2 and going further, fine. Not an issue at all. There is nothing wrong with it. But what I'm trying to say is that as far as this problem is concerned, what is asked, we don't need N2. Sir. Yes. Uh, Instead of taking moment, if you take free body of each. Each, each, okay. I have taken each. Na? First and second. Instead of taking moment. Taking moment for what free body and about what point? For both bodies. No, no. Just so we, we uh, if you go second for. Second body ke liye moment is irrelevant. Why? Because the line of action no, is not known. For first body also, for fx0 and f0, we can calculate uh, n1 and n2. Without taking any moments. We have taken moment there. If we take. Cannot. Uh, only if Just fx and fi will not give the answer because there are three unknowns. Sir, we will get answer. We will not. If you get answer, that's not right answer. Because if you take only fx and fi, just note, don't. this is not a joke. What, what I'm saying is that, suppose f is equal to mu n1. How many unknowns are there? One unknown? Yes. Here, how many unknowns? Two, three. Okay, but if it, f is equal to that, you can get it, yes. We will get, sir. You will get it. Only thing that you have to solve. You will have to solve two simultaneous equations. Simultaneous equation we yeah. will get. But what we are trying to do <laughs> is getting rid of simultaneous equations. We want to solve everything in one shot. You have right. to convert. You are right. You can do simultaneous equation, you can get it. But by taking torque about point B, we got everything in one shot. Yes. Simultaneous equation, the risk is that you make mistake in one, you make mistake in the other. Uh, sir, excuse me. Yes, please. Where? Uh, sir, here. Sir, this side. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, for FVD1, uh, you have taken the moment about B. Moment, yeah, about B. Uh, moment about B. Sir, as you are mentioning uh, that uh, uh, the B point at which uh, this uh, wedge and roller, huh. they are rolling over each other. No, they are not. See, 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 you have to kind of, see, there is a kinematics aspect, there is an equilibrium aspect. The kinematics aspect is only for you to get an idea 
of how the friction or what is happening, how is the slippage happening. It's not that they are always rolling, but the point is that, ki what I have shown here is that, mm. that these are the possible modes in which that sliding can happen. And that visualization is for you to understand that if this moves in like this, and if I assume the slippage here, then what should be the direction of friction? Sir, uh, you are explaining it is very true, sir. Yeah. But I, want, I have one doubt also, sir. This, that uh, yes. while they are rolling over each other. They are not rolling whether, over each other. This is an infinitesimal roll. Whether the friction comes there. Which, which have, point? Which point? At B point, you have shown one friction. Yeah, friction can huh? come. But they are but, equal and opposite for both FBD. Yes. Huh? But, but, only, uh, but only thing you know that what we have seen here is that, that N1, sorry, N1 is less than N2. So the impending slip is happening at 1 and not 2. Okay, it is happening at 1 and not at B. What does that mean? That the slippage is happening like this. Which means that there is no relative slip at these two points. Okay. But no relative slip only means that the friction at that point is not equal to mu times the reaction, normal reaction at that point. Okay. It doesn't mean that the friction is not there. Friction can be there. But we so, cannot say that the friction is equal to mu times the normal reaction. So it will point. change numerical to numerical, these conditions. Depending on problem to problem, Depend you have to change okay. those conditions, of course. Thank but, you, but you need not have impending slippage, but there can still be friction. Okay. Thank you. But thank what you. it means is that F by N is not equal to mu s, it is less than mu s. Thank you, thank you, sir. It means sir, we, are, we are neglecting the friction that... No, we are not neglecting. We are just saying that there is no impending friction there. So, if the normal reaction there is N2, F is not equal to mu times N2, is all we are saying. Okay, it, it is some value. It is some value. So, what is the value? But that's what we get, na? Because what we saw is that the impending friction can happen at 1. So, F is equal to mu times N1. By torque equilibrium or moment equilibrium about point C, you see that this F and this F are to be the same. So, if I can find out N1, I know F and that is the value of F that will come there. Hello, sir. Yes. sir. Yes. Simply by using the concept of friction is, friction is opposite to the direction of motion. Impending motion. Okay. Impending motion for static friction, finite motion for kinetic friction. Okay. Okay. And using the the sign rule or Lamy's theorem, the problem becomes so simple. How will you use Lamy's theorem here? Because you know the line, don't know the there line. Are of, there are only three forces. Ah, for the top one, you can get it. Yes, you can get you it. Not, you are not the for the wedge. wedge. Even also for the wedge, there wedge, are three forces. Wedge you can't use Lamy's theorem because the point is that you, what is the line of action you have to figure out from. And I have not even given you what is the height of this P. I have not given you what is the height of P. Na? Without knowing the height of P, how can you use Lamy's theorem? Hello, sir. 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 Myself, sir. Here. Yeah. yeah, and even if you use Lamy's theorem, okay, good. If you can, I think you can't use it here, but if you can use it, good. But the point is that this procedure, I feel comfortable with this one. Sir, what are the limiting conditions to use the Lamy's theorem? Huh? What are the limiting conditions to use the Lamy's theorem? Uh, you should know the directions of all the forces, first of all. They are known, suppose. Okay, all the directions are known. Then, then the point is that they form a triangle, right? Three forces. So the directions are known here, no? For this one, no? Huh? So, P is going to the left. Okay, good. Good for you. Okay, you can use Lamy's theorem. Okay. Yes. You can use Lamy's theorem. Great. It's fine. In equation summation moment about B equals to 0, huh. can it be N1 R cos theta minus huh. mu N1 R no, 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 no. 1 plus uh, sin of theta Maybe instead of 1 like plus 5? Which one? No, Second no, this one. This is, no, but this... This one. That equation, sir. Which equation are you talking? Summation moment about B equal to 0. Huh. N1 R cos theta minus. Okay, so N1, uh, did I make a mistake there? N1 no, no. R cos no, can theta. Can it be mu N1 R 1 plus sine of theta? R sine no, of it's theta. A, it's a, S is sine theta because that paper ran off. I wrote just S. It is sine theta. Sir, hello, okay. sir. I went to the edge. Yes, please. Yes. Sir, for this uh, second wedge. We can't use Lamy's theorem. We, 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 for Lamy's theorem, we require only three forces. There are three forces, na? <laughs> Where W prime is zero, if you know what is N2 and F, okay, then you know the direction of this. Ah, that. Okay, so you know three. You can do it. But the point is that in this case, na, this simple equilibrium in xy direction is so easy. So you can use it, okay? But the point is that it's completely idiosyncratic. If you wish to use it, I completely agree that you can use it here. Hello, sir. Because they are forming a triangle, you can use it. S is sin theta. I have ran out of paper, okay. So it was towards the end. So I just wrote S. S is sin theta. Sir, sorry. For in this kind of problem, uh, multi-surface contact is there. 
uh, to find out where uh, impending will occur or not. For that, we are checking that number of equations we have and number of unknowns and yes. accordingly. Yes. But how do I beforehand know that the problem will be statically determinate or not? No, no, but that to make it statically determinate, what he's saying is that ki if you apply that much force such that there is a, like you are about to start that motion, now you tell me how much force I need to require. So you are making that problem statically determinate. If I put, is, it is not statically not determinate, determinate. I totally agree. Of course, it is in your hand. Every problem is like we have to decide what is the question we are asking. You are right. No. But if I ask a weird question, not a weird question, if I ask a different question saying, if I apply some P2, then what are the forces? You cannot get the answer. It is indeterminate problem. Sir. But what you can tell is that if that P is less than that P max, then this will be in stable equilibrium, is what you can say. All you can say. In a particular structure, what are the different constraints? And accordingly, how do I check that? Uh, uh, before and we have to decide that uh, whether it is a statically determinant or na not that no, but fiction problems are essentially statically indeterminate problem essentially but the way we make them pseudo statically determinate is by putting this condition so I don't ask that if these are the forces that I'm applying to the system what are the reactions and so on we don't put them that way but we put in this way essentially and for example any real life structure we want that structure to be stable so what we say is that if I apply so and so load if this is a geometry tell us some range where the structure is in equilibrium. So we pose the problems like that and simplify our life, but you are right that in general, friction problems are statically indeterminate problem. Only thing we can say is that for those given coefficient of frictions, for the given loads, given geometries, is the assembly stable or not stable? This is a question we can very nicely un answer. But we cannot find out all the forces for any arbitrary, for, uh, for any arbitrary P or anything. Why? Because number of equations more or less than number of unknowns. So impending slippage only to tell that at what force will that become unstable. Okay, then we go, okay, if the force is lesser, because you can always ask a question, if the P is in the other direction, then at some P, okay, you will see that it will start slipping in this direction. But in between that, it will be stable. Sir, okay, so in the first few bar diagram. I think we are done, I think. If you have any Hello, question. Sir. In the first few bar diagram, yeah? at point A, at point B also, at huh. point A, point B, huh. the friction force is the same. Is yes, it yes, 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 yes. Is it correct, sir? Yes, yes, yes. How it is justified, sir? If no, because you take N2 is greater than N1. No, no, no. But at F point, so just note, how, how, how are they equal? If you take torque for the top free body diagram about point C, N1, N2 are passing through the center. Weight is passing through the center. So only friction is that this is F1, F2, they should be equal. But what is happening is that, that F is equal to mu times N1, but F is not equal to mu times N2. Bottom here. Yes, that's how we are justifying it. It is F, but it is not equal to mu times N2. It's still equal to mu times N1.